I've had several videos on this channel about how computers store numbers and by extension data. But how do they do things with that data? Well, they do it with what is known as a logic gate, the arrangement of which is referred to as Boolean logic. These are the fundamental building blocks for how computers can make decisions based on inputs. First, I will explain what logic gates do. Then I will explain how they do what they do. And knowing these two things, I will explain why they are so important. So let's get started with the what. What is a logic gate? Well, what a logic gate is and what it does is actually pretty simple. It just takes an input or multiple inputs and gives an output. Since we're talking about computers here, the inputs can only be a one or a zero. And likewise, the output can only be a one or a zero. What these ones and zeros actually represent are a weak or non-existent electrical charge in the case of a zero, or a heavy electrical current in the case of a one. These are the physical things that the ones and zeros represent, so keep that in mind as we move forward. The four main logic gates are a NOT gate, an AND gate, and the OR gate, and the XOR gate. Again, this is all much easier than it looks, so bear with me. Let's start with the NOT gate, which has only one input. If we input a zero into this gate, it outputs a one. If we input a one, it outputs a zero. It's just a nice simple flip. Easy enough. So now let's talk about an AND gate. And this one has two inputs, input A and input B. And in each of these, we can only input a one or a zero. So there's a total of four possible combinations. Zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, or one, one. An AND gate will only output a one if both of these inputs are a one. Hence the name AND. It needs a one and a one to be satisfied. In the other three cases, the output will be zero, which of course means no electrical current will be output. And then an OR gate will be satisfied as long as one node or the other node or both nodes have a one input into them. The only time it's going to output a zero is when both these inputs are zero. So here's what its chart looks like. The last one is the XOR gate or ZOR gate, which means exclusively OR. It will be satisfied if one input or the other is a one, but if both inputs are one or both is zero, the output will be zero. There are other types of gates, but I don't want to talk about them so as not to be overwhelming. And they're not really important for now. For now, I want to talk about what these are doing at the physical level. What's actually going on inside your computer to make this happen? Now, for starters, we need to talk about what a transistor is. A transistor is a nifty little invention that acts like a switch. Electrical current is being fed into this prong here, and it wants to come out this one, but it can't. Its path is blocked. If we feed a tiny bit of electrical current through this middle prong, it enables that current to flow and continue. This is extremely useful because it acts like a tiny little switch or a bridge or a door that we can influence and modify without any moving parts. So I know what you're thinking, right? What if we connect the output of this transistor to the middle prong of a different transistor or even to multiple middle prongs of multiple transistors? We could have a domino effect of electrical current. Well, that's the idea behind logic gates. Let's go back to our AND gate. Remember, this one needs both of its inputs, input A and B, to be a one in order for its output to be a one. Now, let's magnify and zoom into this AND gate to see what's going on. The proper way to represent circuitry is like this. And if you wanna know more, I'd encourage you to look into it after this video, but I'm all about simplifying things here on this channel. So I'm going to make a much simpler version of this that still functions. This is the conductive path inside of our AND gate. Current is being fed this way, and it wants to go out this way. This leads to the output of our AND gate. If we can get the current to flow out this way, it's essentially outputting a one, otherwise it's outputting a zero. Now, if this were just connected, it would do just that fine, but we've interrupted its path with these two transistors. This is transistor A, and this is transistor B, and they represent inputs A and B. In order for current to flow from this prong and out this one, we need to apply electrical current to this one in the middle. So if neither of these transistors have a current being fed, then no current will be output. That's like having a zero and a zero input. Good so far. If we turn on this transistor, the current might be able to make it a little further, but still not all the way. And if we turn only this transistor on, it won't make it far at all. 
Only if we turn both of them on will current be able to pass all the way through. The middle prongs for these two transistors are the A and B inputs in our AND logic gate, while the output is here. And so we've made a successful AND gate using transistors. Okay, so how would we make an OR gate, where only one or the other transistor, or both, needs to be active in order for the current to pass through? Uh, probably something like this. Again, if both of these are off, the current has no path to get to the output. If transistor A is open, then it can take this route. And if transistor B is open, it can take this one. If both are open, it will take the easier one or maybe a bit of both. This is where things like resistors come into play. But again, I don't want to be too overwhelming talking about the circuitry. The basic concept remains the same. It has a path. Now let's make a NOT gate. This is the one that has only one input and it flips that input. We want it to output the opposite of what is put in. So here the transistor isn't actually blocking the path to the output. It's blocking a different path. This path basically gets rid of the electrical current by sending it to a ground wire somewhere. Again, I don't want to go too deep into the circuitry. Just imagine that this path is a more desirable one than the output, and it essentially just goes nowhere. So if we input a zero to our NOT gate, meaning we don't supply any current to our transistor, the electrical current flows through the feed and out the output here, meaning our gate outputs electrical current, meaning a one. But if we feed a one into our gate, meaning we're feeding electrical current to our transistor, then it turns on and allows the current to flow, diverting it away from the output, meaning the output becomes a zero. Now, these aren't the only ways to arrange these type of gates, but they are the most straightforward. And I mainly want to emphasize the idea that within each logic gate is sort of its own system of gates, where feeding electrical current can change the outcome of other gates. It's almost as if the transistors themselves are a logic gate that makes a bigger one. And that leads us perfectly into the XOR gate. And this is where it gets really interesting. Remember, for this gate to output a 1, we need either A or B to be fed a 1, but not both or neither. We're going to have to get creative here and make this logic gate by combining the three we just learned about. And to do so, we arrange them like this. To refresh, this triangle is a NOT gate. These D shapes are AND gates. And this D with a curved spine is an OR gate. And here's what they need to be satisfied. Now also keep in mind that wherever there's a dot here, it means the paths of these two conductors do intersect. They are connected. If there isn't a little dot, then the paths don't intersect. One crosses over the other, but they don't touch. To make this easier, I'll change their colors so that we can know these are two separate paths. Now, if you want, you can pause the video and see for yourself how this arrangement satisfies our XOR gate. Otherwise, keep playing and we'll walk through every combination together. If our A and B inputs are both zero, then we end up with a zero here and a one here while this becomes a zero and a one. Neither of the AND gates are satisfied, so they both output a zero, and as a result, the OR gate is fed two zeros, it's not satisfied, outputs a zero. Okay, well, good so far. Now, how about if we input a one for our A node, and then a zero for our B? We end up with a one here and a zero down here. And then we input a zero to our B node, giving us a one here and a zero here. This AND gate on top is satisfied, which is in fact enough to satisfy our OR gate, giving us an output of 1. Awesome. If we input a 0 for A and a 1 for B, then we get the same result but flipped, where the bottom AND gate is satisfied rather than the top. We still end up with a 1 for our OR gate, and it's satisfied and outputs a 1, meaning the gate as a whole has output a 1. Okay, well, what if we input two ones to start with? We end up with a 1 here and a 0 here, and similarly a 0 here and a 1 here. Neither of the AND gates are satisfied, meaning they both output a 0, and the OR gate is not satisfied either. It outputs a 0, so now we have made a fully functional XOR gate. This type of thing, combining logic gates to make larger, more complex ones, is really the fundamental principle behind everything computers do. It's all a question of where to put which ones and how many and how they're connected in relation to other ones and treating those gates as single gates which are part of larger logic equations based in binary, some of which have three inputs or others which are made out of transistors which work the opposite of the ones we talked about. These are known as NPN transistors. This gives us all of the tools we need to implement logic, Boolean logic. 
It's with this logic that computers are able to do math because remember they do everything with binary code of ones and zeros. And this is all literally just math using binary. It's adding, subtracting, and the like with binary code. It's arguably math at its most fundamental and purest form. It's just simple logic. And with math and other conditionals, we can get into things like instructions and commands used in machine code and then assembly language. And before you know it, we've got high level programming languages and then eventually even artificial intelligence. Now, keep in mind, it was a long, long process of getting from this to this. Hundreds of thousands of really smart and creative people using and building on each other's ideas over the course of decades has led us to the point where your phone can play games over the internet. And keep in mind, every second you spend on your computer, whether it's gaming or typing or watching a video, this type of thing is happening millions to billions of times every second. So this could go on and on, but I think I'm starting to ramble. And I just want to end this video here because the main point was to explain how Boolean logic works and why it's needed in computers. If you would be interested in videos on circuitry, transistors, or other ways these logic gates can be arranged to make more complex stuff possible, commenting is the best way to let me know. And of course, liking and subscribing are both a huge help to boosting the channel. Thanks for watching, and as always, I hope I helped.